Welcome to our second Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration, SCCA and RBDB Chambers ADR webinar. I'm James McPherson, International ADR Specialist and SCCA Special Counsel. My learned friend, Michael Cover, founder member of RBDB Chambers and I will be moderating our round tables. And today we have three rapid rounds. The first is our mediation experts round table followed by a brief video clip, which we will show and our round table with ADR practitioners from some of the major law firms working in the region today. We'll conclude with an executive summary uh, and some additional insights of his own from Michael Patchett Joyce QC. So we're especially delighted that we have so many great colleagues with us today, including many seasoned practitioners, arbitrators, mediators, senior management professionals and government representatives from across the MENA region, North and South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. What brought us together today is our shared passion for ADR to resolve international commercial disputes and its application, obviously, in the kingdom, but also the wider region, and to perform at the top of our respective games and to encourage various reforms, refinements, and best practices. It's our goal today to share with one another all our individual and collective experiences to ensure we have the requisite information and up-to-date analysis of both domestic, international, commercial mediation and arbitration. Few regions have more made more advances in the field of ADR over the last decade uh, as Saudi Arabia, and that record um, requires some unpacking. For detailed analysis, SCCA is happy to share a number of articles that have appeared over the last six years that highlight and uh, provide real insight into what has transformed the kingdom into the ADR friendly jurisdiction that it has become. So specifically, it will analyze the arbitration legislation, the ADR center itself, the performance of the Saudi judiciary, the bar, the work of local and international practitioners, including men and women, old and young, legal and other professionals being retained uh, as both arbitrators and mediators. And fundamental to the well-functioning of this ADR ecosystem in the kingdom as everywhere, um, would be appropriate judicial support, successful enforcement at home and internationally, and ever-increasing caseloads uh, in the kingdom for mediation and arbitration. Our speakers come from the kingdom and internationally, all leaders in their field. Uh, session one, the mediation in KSA, we will feature first from Saudi Arabia, a mediator and ADR practitioner, Rosanna Altiar, who is a skilled neutral and very popular trainer across the region. Then Musad al Harib, who's SCCA's business manager and partnerships development. And he's obviously done great things uh, for SCCA in ADR, but I'd like to thank Musad's team, which includes Ms. Nof, that many of you have had the opportunity uh, to connect with in preparation for today's webinar. Then SCCA's chief registrar and general counsel, Chris Alberti. He's a colleague and uh, with a long international career, including the GCC and Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah. Um, and then longtime Middle East hand, Dr. Mark Coyle, who's an arbitrator mediator that many of us have had the privilege of working with over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, so let's get started. I'll have some questions for each of the experts. I'll begin with mediation and specifically with round one. Um, I'd like to explore some of the developments and focus on what makes mediation work in the kingdom and the region. So to begin, Let's have some remarks from our colleague, Rosanna Altayar. Um, Rosanna, welcome. Uh, there's new legislation regarding core costs in Saudi Arabia. And from your perspective as a mediator in Saudi, how do you see this impacting mediation moving forward? This is a great question. Judicial costs and fees regulation in Saudi aims to reduce the number of malicious lawsuits the judicial system is currently suffering from and encourage disputants to refer to amicable options such as mediation. This regulation has actually come as an opportunity for the parties to explore an informal voluntary process where the parties have the power to shape the outcome based on their interests before escalating the dispute to a costly and time consuming method. So I believe we will see an increase in uh, me, you know, request to mediate uh, once uh, this regulation is in place. Excellent. I think that um, it's important for those working in the region to know how each jurisdiction is functioning 
and what to expect, but also those from outside. Most of the people logging in today are from outside of the region and they're interested in knowing. And so I think it's reassuring what you've been saying about your experiences that although there have been challenges and, and issues along the way that you've managed to address those in, in due course. I, I also I want to echo what you said because in the mediations I've done in the kingdom in the past, um, many litigants or disputants from the GCC have wanted to do their mediations or otherwise uh, meet arbitration outside the kingdom. And the good news is that over the last several years, because of the things you've been talking about and because of things we're going to elaborate on today, much of that has changed. And so in, I don't have that experience anymore of people wanting to assemble in, in Germany or UK or whatever. They're very happy to hold their hearings and their sessions uh, in the kingdom itself. Um, I think, do you have any concluding remarks before we move on to our next speaker with regard to what business people need to consider when they're weighing their options about going to the kingdom to mediate? Well, I would, I would start by asking business leaders the following question. How do you deal with a business dispute once negotiations have reached a deadlock? Do you try again, resort to a third party to help with the negotiations or proceed with litigation or simply end the business relationship? I mean, in a Harvard Business Review article, uh, Mark Gerzen says, keep in mind that your ability to navigate conflict is one of the primary ways that you reveal your character as a leader. So you can navigate conflict by negotiation or by resorting to a neutral and impartial third party to help facilitate the negotiation to reach an acceptable agreement. This means that it is essential that executives and business leaders are fully aware of the options available to them to manage the dispute in a productive way. It is worth noting that Saudi Arabia has set up the infrastructure for an attractive trade and investment environment by establishing the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration, as well as ratifying the Singapore Convention on Mediation. So my, recommend, my recommendation would be to business leaders to ensure that the business interests are protected through a well-structured dispute resolution clause, emphasizing mediation, which involves no rigid rules or procedures as a first step towards amicable resolution. Mediation gives executives the necessary control to craft an outcome which serves everyone's needs and interests, making them effective leaders and reliable models to the stakeholders of the organization. Thank That's you. well put. And I can tell you that mediating in the kingdom myself, if you closed your eyes, you wouldn't know where you were in the world. The, the caliber of the people is, is of an international standing, the council, whether they're local or international in the room, um, their experts, their management teams, they're really a very sophisticated group, as I'm sure everyone on this call is well aware. I believe uh, Musad al Kherb is with us. I can't see his visage. It, can he turn his camera on live? I think... Uh, Musad, Mujud. What we'll do as we're getting our brother into the mix, we'll press straight on to our, our next uh, colleague, which is uh, Chris Alberti. I think, uh, I'm just seeing if, I don't think I see uh, Musad there, fine. We'll, we'll get back to him in a moment. I know he's on site, he's just not on camera. So for Chris Alberti, um, I think it'd be helpful to hear from him as chief registrar and general counsel of the Saudi center, um, how basically the remote aspect of mediation conferences in the kingdom has impacted uh, the use of mediation in the kingdom through the SECA and others. So have you seen any impact uh, in terms of the overall success rate, settlement rate between remote and in-person mediations? And has there been an impact uh, on the holding of caucuses and other features of, of mediation itself? Thank you, James, uh, for allowing me to share my thoughts on this. And uh, thank you also for this kind of invitation uh, to everyone. Uh, as to your question, while the jury is still out there at this point, uh, we have at least observed slightly lower settlement rates regarding mediations that have been held remotely. Uh, there might be many reasons for that. And while the experience has been largely positive, uh, holding mediation conferences remote creates obviously a totally different experience and negotiation environment. Uh, of course, 
mediation doesn't have the so-called hot seat cross-examination. So that perceived uh, impacts on providing evidence, if at all needed in mediation, uh, is in my view neglectable. Also, uh, not picking up body language, intonations, uh, or any other nonverbal cues, uh, again, will not break your case as no one's really judging uh, the veracity of what your witness says. Um, what I found quite interestingly was a recent report uh, on the psychological impact of remote hearings uh, that was published by the Berkeley Research Group, uh, which concluded that while the impact cannot be ignored, it is not significant enough to influence the proceedings. And that's for arbitrations, where it matters more than my view. Uh, that all said, as we all know, mediation is a people's process and uh, the mental preparedness and, if you will, the level of commitment to engage plays a key role. Of course, staring at a screen, as we do today, uh, for prolonged periods of time is considerably less engaging and demanding more skilled mediators uh, to break the ice, uh, particularly when you have no cookies and coffee on the table, and to essentially ensure that the attention span does not dip when it matters most. Now, it is not easy. Uh, to walk away from a table, it is much easier to turn off a, a, a computer, if you will. And that's also one of those key factors that we always have to be aware of. Uh, that is, uh, in essence, I believe uh, where the real challenge lies is mediators uh, that can even read and entertain a remote crowd. I think that is really important here. So for me, a key factor that drives the success rate is and remains the quality of the mediator, not so much whether it's remote or in person. James? Well, I see a question here from Ahmed Sa. He said, what type of evidence is adaptable in mediation in Saudi Arabia? Are they the same as acceptable by the courts? Um, I think, do you want to answer that? I can simply uh, quick, uh, in the jump, uh, jumping quickly for that one. Uh, what evidence in the classical sense, as you may see in adversarial processes, uh, we don't see that that often happening in mediation. It is really uh, uh, rather a process where you try to understand the business needs behind the scenes. Yes, here and there, mediation will also uh, ask for a certain evidence. Uh, show me the invoice that you're referring to. But it is uh, rather a process where you, uh, you know, in indeed try to facilitate the negotiation between parties as a mediator. I think what's also interesting, and I agree with what you just outlined, uh, Chris, I think is that um, mediation has the feeling um, of, of a series of sprints online as opposed to a marathon. Um, that's been meaning that you sometimes have multiple sessions, whereas um, in a typical mediation, as all of you know, it tends to feel more like a marathon. You're all there first thing in the morning and you might be there till quite late at night or resume the next morning. But it, things tend to be resolved within a 24 hour period uh, by and large, unless or maybe a, a supplemental session to address some of the evidentiary issues that, that the questioner alluded to. But um, in this form of mediation, I find it quite common to, to chop it up into bite-sized pieces, much as Chris said a moment ago, uh, that as people stare at the screen, uh, things wane. And so it's not a bad thing to get, let people have some time to gather themselves and, and collect their evidence. One last question, Chris. Um, because Saudi Center actually has been doing a pilot project with the Ministry of Justice, among others, and they're moving along quite nicely, um, I was curious to know what the fact that settlement agreements can actually be converted into enforceable bonds under the SCCA's Pilot 2 program. Um, do you think that has affected the way mediators themselves have handled the sessions? Um, very good question. Uh, allow me to give a little more background, and I'm sure my colleague uh, Mossad uh, will uh, further explore that uh, point as well. So we did indeed have uh, mediation programs that allow parties to convert settlement agreements into a final and enforceable bond that can be directly enforced. It's almost, uh, if you think about the Singapore Convention at local institution level. Now, uh, in contrast to what you may know as homologation processes in other jurisdictions, the SCCA has, uh, as a special the accredited center by the Ministry of Justice, uh, the power to take all necessary steps towards obtaining such bond for the parties within a few days. And under these special programs, uh, we even did so at no additional cost. Now, like uh, the Singapore Convention, perhaps also worth mentioning, the grounds for refusal are very limited, and the review usually relates to public policy, Sharia compliance, and uh, the usual ability to settle the dispute. Now, to the question itself, I think what this really goes to is, uh, can a mediator help be held liable? Because now you have an output that essentially is uh, enforceable. Uh, we have seen that arbitrators now these days are not as uh, safe anymore, if you will, in some jurisdictions, and can get sued. So how does it work for mediators? 
Um, I think the best I can here say to calm down the situation is to say that we have Article 14 in our mediation rules that indeed excludes mediators from liability. Uh, in fact, uh, no mediator shall be made a party of any judicial proceedings and also no mediator shall be held liable to any party or participant in the mediation proceedings for any error, act or omission. Now, uh, of course, I cannot rule out that intent or even gross negligence may get you in trouble in some jurisdictions. Uh, but it is also true that parties cannot uh, can simply walk away from the negotiation table. So the risk here to being pulled into such a situation is rather slim. Uh, it may be comforting to know from mediators uh, that the SCCA looks at the settlement agreements before it starts the conversion process. And it is uh, mainly to secure compliance with, again, Sharia, uh, capacity to settle, and a few other factors. Uh, what is also perhaps noteworthy is that uh, the conciliation center to the Ministry of Justice, with whom we cooperate, uh, will ultimately approve the process and it also will take a look at this. So in essence, uh, there are many layers of protection until the conversion process is completed, though it's a very quick process. We're talking about days in, in the end, but uh, it, uh, there are some processes in place to ensure that you have an uh, enforceable and not a non-enforceable bond. James? Thank you. Um, I think what's interesting too, I mean, obviously some of these, these things haven't been tested as yet, uh, meaning I'm not aware, whereas I'm aware of, for example, the US and, and other jurisdictions where people have actually sought to, to bring mediation into the courts. Uh, and generally they've been uh, handled properly by the judiciary, the rebuffed or, or um, the, the, the uh, judges in places like California have not actually been willing to hear uh, evidence uh, or have evidence submitted to the court that had been uh, previously submitted in the mediation context. But I think that the general consensus from the Saudi lawyers and international practitioners I've spoken to in the kingdom is that people are actually very much uh, expecting that the judiciary will uh, behave in a similar fashion and, and uphold the confidentiality uh, and the inadmissibility features, as well as we hope uh, the not having them prosecuted. We've had some in recent years in, in the wider region issues of arbitrators and others being prosecuted, but that has not been the case in the kingdom, alhamdulillah. And I don't think it will be uh, repeated, uh, inshallah, in some of these other jurisdictions. So I'd like to turn quickly to uh, our brother, Dr. Mark Hoyle. Um, and I see him there. Um, welcome, Mark. Um, I'm particularly interested to carry on this theme about the differences you know, locally and, and internationally. And I wanted to know if there are any differences that you found, uh, media and commercial disputes in the GCC and the UK, and if there are any concerns you've heard from clients who are considering mediating in the kingdom that maybe uh, you haven't heard in other jurisdictions. Yes, uh, it, it's an interesting one because uh, I, I have had one uh, about a month ago. Uh, and one of the parties said, well, we can't go to the Middle East because you know they just don't do the thing proper and it's one of those ridiculous things where you have to turn around and say look you've got to sort it out because you have to have it to sort it out otherwise it's not going to work but that is the same uh, i'm afraid in in many places and i and i said for example um in um, one of the over the um, I, I can't say at the moment uh, the, who the party was, obviously, but uh, one of the uh, French parties would say, look, we can't do it. Uh, we can't do it because we don't actually want to have people in the Middle East doing things uh, in that case. And I said, look, you, you, it's, you've, you just take it. It's the ordinary time. So. I was persuaded it. Um, I was persuading the guy, uh, which is, uh, I was the first guy there doing that, uh, that it's perfectly okay. And after about two days, I, he said, um, okay, um, both of the people like it, well, let's do it. And I thought that was right and, and proper, but it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it really is difficult to persuade people from England, for example, or France or something like that, to do something overseas, you know, and um, it, it's, a, so it's, it's difficult and it's rather um, outrageous in, in some ways. So, um, but I've, I've done it and I'm sure many other people have done it and it ought to continue. I think um, 
in terms of what people's expectations are of the region, I think it's always important to remind those outside that there are no restraints in terms of travel, in terms of representation, in terms of language, in terms of facilities, in terms of uh, even the supports of the courts uh, in the kingdom. Um, and I think that, that this may not have been the case uh, in decades uh, past, but that is certainly the case at present. And it's a very impressive situation because you've got people from literally across the world, men, women, young and old, um, uh, counts, lawyers and non-lawyer, neutrals, experts and others coming to the kingdom to do this. So I think people need to realize how flexible and open uh, the jurisdiction really is and, and accessible. Obviously, at present, COVID is, is uh, making all of this seem uh, uh, a bit of a challenge, which it is. But I think the virtual certainly closes that gap. Just one second question for, for you, uh, Mark. Um, thinking about what do we need as practitioners and as the SCCA and RBDB chambers and others, those who are commenting, reviewing and collecting information, what sort of data or information do you think would be helpful to collect um, on our part to help you know, strengthen the case for mediation in Saudi and in the GCC generally? Yes, it's a difficult one, but I, I can give a little bit uh, of, of the Algerian one, which I was going to um, talk about. Um, and I've decided, actually, I, I'm not going <laughs> to say anything about um, But uh, the Algerian parties um, found it very difficult to make the case for either side. And then the aunt actually had to get into it at that stage and then everybody else will tick in now that's perfectly okay if the aunt um, of the other man her family it will accept it but if they don't accept it it's going to just cancel it out but it's difficult and i and the algerian case uh, which was the first time that i had uh, in that particular case uh, was was very tough really tough and there was a third party and it's obviously making either broken down or building up uh, but it's very difficult so um, but you can do it you can do it if you can persuade people to do it it's rather like uh, all of the c cases uh, if you can persuade people you can get it i think it's interesting too to consider the uh when Chris said that perhaps some of the mediations haven't been resolving as quickly uh, with the virtual model, I think this affects the stats in a way that should also include, for example, the fact that it is easier, less expensive, and easier to ramp them up. So I suspect I've seen that, that there's been an increase in, in mediation. And I think a lot of people are moving more quickly to it because it is easier in the virtual environment. There are no planes to board, uh, no visas to be had, and whatever for different uh, participants. So I think that, that the, the, the ease of, of kicking it off is probably impacting statistics as well. Um, but look, uh, we do have uh, our brother Musad now with us. Uh, so I will get straight into Musad. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask Musad about this uh, SCCA MOJ pilot project, which has been going on for some time, this cooperative agreement that we have. Um, how would you generally describe the first steps of this process and can you shed some light on this special project? Because it is something quite innovative for the kingdom and the region um, to have this cooperation between an ADR center and the Ministry of Justice. Well, um, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, uh, James, for uh, the introduction. And uh, also would like to uh, welcome our uh, colleagues, the distinguished uh, speakers here. And also, uh, as a SCCA member, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, our uh, partners, the uh, RTB, in there, uh, for their uh, interest in, in partnering, uh, partnering with us in, in such an uh, event. Um, I probably will not maybe add as much as our distinguished uh, colleagues uh, mentioned, but I might also just uh, shed light about the, uh, the uh, let's say that the process of uh, the uh, collaboration between the SCCA and the judicial sector in, in the kingdom, uh, represented by, uh, of course, the Minister of Justice. Uh, well, the the beginnings actually started uh, 
I mean, somehow a long time ago, uh, since like 2017, uh, even before what uh, is usually called the um, conciliation uh, organization activation, which is in Arabic, uh, uh, where the uh, communication and discussions were uh, conducted uh, between SCCA and the uh, the Commercial Courts Development Commission uh, on discussing how can we uh, refer commercial cases from courts to uh, SCCA to be resolved by mediation. It was a new uh, uh, area, new uh, I mean, uh, process for uh, both of us as, as the judicial uh, sector, how to uh, transfer these kinds of uh, cases where uh, the Parties already they have the uh, opponents uh, between each other, and uh, also with, with no agreement uh, to 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 choose our, to choose mediation, and also for us to how how can we uh, uh, manage the relationship with, with the uh, with the with such a judicial uh, sector? Well, and uh, I'll not say a couple, but many actually uh, meetings discussions be made. On uh, discussing the uh, rules, procedural uh, matters, the technical uh, and and uh, logistical uh, uh, trainings and and etc. to uh, to to uh, succeed in this uh, uh, initiative. And my oh, sorry. Yes. please go ahead. Not to fuddle. <laughs> okay. So and, and 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 that was being actually officially translated in uh, the in, in October 2018, where the uh, official um, uh, MOU was being signed between the SCCA and the Minister of Justice uh, to uh, enable uh, mediation in, in commercial courts, uh, and then the the I would say I would say the, the first. Uh, Pilot project, SCCA MOJ pilot project uh, launched, uh, where it was you know um, targeted several points. Um, for example, uh, speaking of the uh, geographical uh, side, it, it aims to 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 target the uh, uh, the real commercial court as 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 a, a very uh, limited uh, source of cases, and also the the amount it, uh, it, it aims to to to, uh, to, to target the uh, small let's say amount of disputes the 300,000 Saudi real uh, disputes and, and lower uh, and also uh, in terms of the representation uh, it aims to uh, receive cases from directly from claimant and respondents without uh, representatives of lawyers uh, and also to uh, make sure that these kinds of cases uh, were uh, they, they were uh, submitted as a first submission in, in court, just to make sure uh, that the, this kind these cases were uh, reviewed uh, before in, in, in court. Um, that pro that uh, project was actually uh, executed uh, physically, where um, me and myself and also our colleagues, case counsels, were, were attending uh, in hearings and, and, and with, uh, along with, with the judges and, and the parties uh, weekly to uh, uh, trying to uh, convince parties after the judge, once he uh, reviewed the first, uh, let's say, submissions uh, from parties, to um, encouraging them to choose mediation through an uh, you know a, a, a independent institution such as SCCA, where the, he can refer to us, so parties can uh, you know uh, ask questions and get the answers before they sign on the agree the mediation agreement uh, on spot to uh, uh, refer uh, their cases. Where we managed uh, thankfully to to actually transfer. Um, uh, around more than actually 19 uh, cases uh, were uh, transferred at spot from the court 
to uh, to uh, SCCA to be resolved by um, uh, mediation. Um, that shows, we believe, as a first first steps uh, on 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 the transformation of the uh, dispute resolution for for uh, Saudi parties from litigation to uh, mediation. Well said, and I think it's important to note that historically, all the jurisdictions around the world, it was court-connected caseloads that got things sort of uh, going. I mean, in, in some places like Canada and the United States, it was insurance companies who used it for some of their uh, mass claims and, and the rest of it uh, quite effectively. But ultimately, around the world, it has been court-connected programs that have raised that awareness, developed the credibility among the user community, uh, and there's been considerable uptake. And what you alluded to, Masada, a moment ago, it's really important, the work of the centers in converting, inviting, educating, converting people's interest or out reaching out to people to convince them to consider participating in mediation. And during the networking session, at the conclusion of today, uh, where you'll all be invited to join, you can actually ask Ms. Rosanna, because she's among many of the Saudi mediators who have done these cases in connection with this uh, program with the courts, and I'm sure I know from a past experience, she has some very good and useful insights on that. Just to conclude very briefly, Musad, could you speak to perhaps what you see yourself um, and the SCCA in terms of the appetite and the demand for mediation? How do you see the market for those who are interested in what the activity level looks like, at least from your perspective? Well, um, I can assure you, uh, James, that uh, the appetite is, is high. Um, as far as, as we uh, notice and we, we, we see as, as an uh, institution, uh, as, a, as an independent uh, institution from the uh, judicial uh, sector and the, the parties, uh, there are actually, uh, you, there is a huge interest in, in, in mediation. Uh, we believe the, the challenge was only in enabling this kind of uh, interest to uh, to be uh, executed and uh, in, in uh, also uh, raising the awareness of the the uh, concept of, of mediation in uh, in parties, especially I mean I'm speaking uh, locally in, in, in Saudi Arabia, the uh, we believe still the uh, whether legal and business uh, sectors uh, they need to be uh, more educated, more uh, 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 trained in, in, in mediation uh, well, as, as, a, as a parties, or representatives, or even as a mediators. Um, uh, the second pilot, for example, which happened, which uh, took place after the pandemic, to which transferred all the cases uh, to be re resolved me, uh, virtually. Uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a huge uh, uh, transformation of uh, resolving all the uh, procedure, the dispute procedures by uh, online, uh, with of course the help of our uh, colleagues, uh, the mediators, especially uh, Ms. Rosanna, uh, who worked with us in this uh, pilot as well. Um, that shows uh, the, the, uh, the real interest in, in parties of in resolving their dispute. Who they actually was aware of any uh, uh, demanding to to uh, to succeed in in, in this uh, process, even though there were any a huge and, and, and big technical difficulties and issues, uh, some of it prevents parties to 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 continue in in in, in the mediation uh, process. But still, uh, parties they are keen to. Uh, Go again and 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 start the process again, just to uh, resolve it uh, by mediation. And that, by the way, that was in, in, even before the uh, the judicial fees law that has been uh, issued. So uh, yes, so, so the, the appetite is, is much higher. Thank you, Ustad Musad. Um, I think um, even Musad was among the many people at the center who on occasion have heard the raised voices of some of the parties and the mediations I've done at the center. Um, so I think, I think it's important to stress that, that it really is not only culturally appropriate, but 
but highly effective. Even those ones where people were uh, audibly um, engaged and, and emotional, they did resolve. These cases do tend, as all of you know, to lead to a resolution. Um, so it is a highly effective process in the kingdom today. We're just before we get on to the practitioners roundtable, where we have our colleagues in from uh, in and outside of the kingdom. We're just going to show a very quick uh, two-minute video clip, and um, I will turn this over, control over to our people in Riyadh, so they can just run this very brief clip. Where can you find a more flexible and effective solution for resolving commercial disputes? Where does justice move at a faster pace, saving you a significant amount of time and the process and enforcement are simplified? At the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration. Saudi Arabia's National and International Center of Excellence for Institutional Commercial Arbitration makes it easier to do business, support investment, enhance contract effectiveness, and access to justice. It is competitive with preeminent arbitral institutions around the world, not only in expertise and services, but also in its fees. In fact, SCCA has reduced its case registration fees by 50% that will be credited towards the total amount in administrative fees. Furthermore, SCCA has adjusted its fees to correspond to the value of the dispute. It starts at 2,000 reals and is capped at 300,000 reals for any arbitration case, even if the amount in dispute is 30 billion reals. As for arbitrator fees, the new fee schedule reduces them up to 30%. The parties can now choose to compensate arbitrators for their time incurred on either an hourly basis or based on the amount in dispute, also known as the ad valorem method. SCCA helps you choose the ideal type of arbitration for your dispute by understanding how much the arbitration proceeding will cost you, even before you file your case with SCCA. When you open SCCA's interactive calculator on our website, you can see the cost by entering the amount in dispute in either reals or dollars. The calculator provides you with the total cost of arbitration based on your selection of the type of arbitration, ordinary, expedited, or online, or ODR arbitration, and the number of arbitrators, one or three, you decide. For example, if the dispute is worth 1 billion reals, the calculator gives you estimated total fees that are 27% lower than in the previous fee schedule. Helpful news! What about smaller disputes? Is your dispute worth 200,000 to 4 million reals? The calculator will provide you the cost details for expedited arbitration, which will cost you about 20% less than ordinary arbitration with one arbitrator, and about 66% less than an ordinary arbitration with three arbitrators. If the value of the dispute does not exceed 200,000 reals, the calculator will show you two options, ODR and expedited arbitration. With details for each, it will show you that ODR is the most cost-effective option here as it saves you 56% compared to expedited arbitration and 65% compared to ordinary arbitration with one arbitrator. Not only that, SCCA now also allows for flexible solutions such as the possibility to advance arbitrator deposits and installments as outlined in a newly amended Appendix 1 to the SCCA arbitration rules, all to ensure maximum party autonomy and choice. Try our fee calculator and see the exact fees for your case. Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration providing access to justice. Thank you very much, uh, Ria. That was a very uh, engaging video. I, I think it's really important, this sort of video, and three reasons, for three reasons. One, if you look at arbitration and uh, ADR centers around the world, a lot of their videos are targeted strictly to their, their local market. I, I get the feeling from this video, obviously, that we're really interested in, in the globe. But it provides a tool, and I think people want to compare what the rates are going to be like here and there. But at the end of the day, a lot of practitioners insist that parties adopt 
um, state stepped clauses, meaning negotiation, mediation, and then if required, arbitration in lieu of, of final litigation. And so we, I think we heard some good things about mediation from our panel now, uh, and we're going to shift gears. I'm going to turn this over to our colleague in London. I'd like to introduce our co-host and moderator, Michael Cover. He's founder member of RBDB Chambers in London and worldwide. And Michael's going to introduce and facilitate the second round, which is with our expert panel of practitioners. Michael. Thank you, James. Uh, and um, I, uh, the theme here is um, how is arbitration working in the kingdom and why? So uh, our first panelist is Zahed Kashem, and uh, he's the managing partner of uh, Kashem and Associates. And uh, he's got both uh, qualifications legal qualifications in the US and uh, in the kingdom. He's also got a Bachelor of Engineering, so he's still qualified. Uh, so had, um, I wonder if you could just maybe set the scene for us and just tell us a little bit about how you see arbitration working in the kingdom and why. And I was going to ask you in particular about the role of that the Saudi courts uh, have in Saudi arbitration proceedings. So Zayhad, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you very much uh, to the SCCA <clears throat> for hosting us uh, for this uh, great event. Um, I'm going to be sharing a, a couple of slides here to kind of um, position us uh, within the discussion. So if I may go ahead and do that, see if this works. Um, okay, I think this should be working now. Do you see uh, my screen? Okay, so um, essentially the question was, what, you know, what, how do, what do courts, what do Saudi Arabian courts, uh, what, do they, what role do they play in connection with an arbitration? And in order for us to answer that question, uh, we figured that we would outline it in three phases. The role of the courts before the arbitration actually commences, uh, the role of the courts uh, while the arbitration is ongoing, and the role of courts uh, after. So let's go ahead and dive into it. In terms of the role of the courts before arbitration, um, James mentioned this just a moment ago, is that uh, various uh, contracts call for an escalation uh, mechanism between the parties that before they reach arbitration or litigation, they need to go through some kind of mediation process, escalation process to their senior personnel. Um, we've had uh, very good experience in having courts enforce those provisions before they would allow one uh, mover, one party to uh, call for an arbitration to commence. So the, role, the, the court's role in connection with arbitration before arbitration commences is to enforce the agreement between the parties in relation to how arbitration can actually be invoked. Um, the other uh, uh, role that local uh, Saudi courts would play in the context of arbitration is that if there is a dispute over a sole arbitrator in a sole arbitra arbitrator arbitration uh, or for the president of a panel to be appointed, then uh, you would go to the courts and, and the courts would um, appoint one for you, assuming, of course, that you've not utilized a, a institutional um, a set of rules that govern how the uh, uh, tribunal would be constituted. So that would be another role that uh, courts uh, would play. Okay, so now that let's say you've, you've constituted your, um, uh, your, your panel, uh, the arbitration panel, and, and you know, they, they've, they've started uh, their work um, and there was you know, no escalation clause or an escalation clause was there and was enforced. While the arbitration is ongoing, the court still plays a very important role. Um, think about the court as kind of the ultimate uh, uh, power, the, the, the place where they, the tribunal will, will get their power from uh, in, a, in a number of different uh, issues. So the first thing is that the court can remove an arbitrator um, in certain cases, like bribery and, and, and conflict of interest if, 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 uh, if it is proved, uh, proven in, to the court. So that is something that the courts uh, could play a role in. Usually courts are uh, not uh, uh, as uh, accommodating with those requests and actually set a quite a high, high bar uh, for the litigants to prove uh, before they would dismiss um, an arbitrator, at least in, in, uh, in my experience. Another thing that uh, the courts would be involved with uh, is if the tribunal needed a temporary preservation or an injunction to be issued, for example, in relation to a construction site to ensure that a construction, construction does not continue or an asset is not sold, 
um, you would uh, the tribunal would seek that from uh, from the court. So that is another form of support that the court uh, would provide the tribunal. And the third uh, aspect of the, the where a court would uh, play uh, a role during arbitration uh, is just general assistance in relation to calling for witnesses, requesting uh, certain documents, uh, issues relating to discovery um, type uh, requests uh, and so on that the tribunal may not be able to, uh, to provide. So, so far we've been talking about the role of courts I presented the role of courts before the arbitration commences and about the escalation clause and disputes over the tribunal. And then we moved on to the role of courts during arbitration um, and the ability to move and remove and kind of support the tribunal. What happens after the, tribun the, the arbitration uh, ends? Well, the role of the court there is quite simple, either validate or invalidate an, uh, the award. And I saw as uh, we were listening to the uh, fantastic discussion on mediation a moment ago is whether an arbitration award is final and binding. It is final and binding. Uh, that is the case under Saudi law. However, under very limited circumstances, Article 50 of the Saudi Arabian arbitration law sets out, sets out very limited circumstances uh, by which you can convince a court to uh, invalidate the award. And essentially, they go into kind of two themes. One is whether um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the award does not meet uh, Sharia principles um, or did not afford the uh, other party the ability to defend itself, or what everybody knows here that has, been, that has acted as an arbitrator, jurisdiction, jurisdiction, jurisdiction. Uh, essentially, that, that, is, that is the one um, point that all of us as uh, potential uh, arbitrators and as actual arbitrators need to, uh, need to know that you need to act within the confines of the framework that you've been given within the, the contract and the agreement between the parties. And whatever you think is equitable, whatever you think is fair, you cannot go out of that um, because you risk a court invalidating uh, your award. And of course, uh, you go to the court to validate your award uh, by having the court add the enforcement language turning it into an enforceable instrument that then you can take and enforce uh, in an enforcement court. So that's the role of a court uh, before, during, and after. Michael, back to you. So thank you. I thought that was absolutely crystal clear and it really gave us great food for thought, particularly interesting on court assistance on the formation of the tribunal. I just have one other question just before we move on to Stuart, and that is, um, to what extent is the uh, the government or state-owned enterprises in the kingdom being able to use and is actually using uh, arbitration? Sorry, you're going to. I tell you what, you've just taken me back to recent legal developments. Why don't you go? go what, what, just go ahead with that one briefly. Uh, say sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll do a, a very quick overview. And sorry, should take uh, you a bit off piece then. No, no, no worries, no worries. A number of people have have already raised a few of those points. So, in terms of recent legal developments, and these are quite important because quite a lot of them fall into uh, the, the general theme of reg regulatory reform in Saudi Arabia, and here, of course, specifically judicial reform within the context of Vision 2030. So what has occurred over the past couple of years, and this is a quick review over that. The first is what uh, um, Rosanna mentioned earlier, judicial cost law. This is very important because it, it now introduces a cost to engage in commercial litigation. Not every court requires a fee, but certainly commercial litigation that falls under certain uh, requirements will require the applicants to pay 5% of the claimed amount up to an amount of 1 million Saudi reals. So that makes uh, litigation now perhaps not as attractive as it once was as a free option to uh, litigate and hopefully will decrease caseload to courts and enhance um, uh, the uh, uh, ability of, of courts and judges to focus on the cases uh, that they have. Another important addition to the uh, judicial cost law, which by the way is not yet law, it is, has been um, uh, announced, it will be uh, distributed in the, judicial, in the uh, official gazette, and then six months later it will come into effect, so it's still uh, a ways away. Uh, but in relation to arbitration specifically, arbitral awards, um, as, you, as I just mentioned, an applicant can apply to invalidate the award. If that applicant loses that request, that party ends up paying 1% of the value of the award or up to 1 million reals. This decreases the ability of, uh, or decreases the likelihood 
of parties to move to invalidate awards based on a whim or just a procedural aspect just to prolong uh, the, the process where now they know they're, they're going to end up uh, paying a bit more if they think if they uh, determine that their case is not as, as strong as it, as it could be. Another um, piece of legislation that was issued last year, the commercial court law, this was a very important development. Um, it allows now the parties to commercial disputes to uh, essentially agree bespoke litigation, how evidence will be presented, how case briefs are going to be presented, the timeline, um, uh, how witnesses will be called, um, and so on. So this creates a kind of a almost a peri uh, uh, uh measure as compared to arbitration that allows litigants to uh, or parties to litigation to agree uh, the way that they conduct uh, uh, themselves uh, and also allows the publication of uh, uh, or the rapid publication of uh, opinions uh, from courts, uh, thus giving litigants and, and parties a bit more predictability in relation to the outcome of their cases because they can see where courts uh, are at. Um, and just a, a few weeks ago, the Saudi Arabian arbitration law itself was amended um, that re and to remove the need to have uh, a contract with the arbitrators. This is a strong indication of, of support to institutional arbitration because as you know, for institutional arbitration, um, you can essentially have your contract with the institution uh, as opposed to with the parties, and this uh, uh, moves uh, in that direction. So, Michael, that was the second part, and I'm happy now to answer your third question, uh, if if uh, if you'd like me to. Well, just very briefly, this was um, the use that uh, in the kingdom that governments and state-owned enterprises are able to uh, uh, use arbitration. Just maybe a minute or so would. Then sure. we keep to time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay. So again, keeping with Vision 2030 themes, keeping with um, uh, judicial uh, reform. Um, everybody knows that the arbitrate the, the Saudi Arabian arbitration law prevents government entities from uh, using arbitration to settle their disputes unless a specific law is issued in relation uh, to that, allowing them to do so. Two laws uh, have been issued that. Um, uh, allow this now. The first is the government procurement law. When the government procurement law was issued, it allows the Minister of Finance to have any government entity resort to arbitration. This is fantastic uh, in relation to a number of the uh, projects that are happening around Saudi Arabia in that now uh, international and local uh, investors and contractors can opt to have arbitration should the Minister of Finance agree in relation to certain types uh, of projects. So this is uh, great news certainly for government procurement. The second law that was issued, um, when the Council of Ministers um, uh, passed the, uh, this law, uh, it uh, stated that the National Center for, Pri for Privatization uh, will issue certain rules that would then allow uh, any government entity that engages in a privatization initiative and a contract to utilize arbitration and in fact, even foreign law. Um, so that is also a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic news for privatization in the kingdom, and gives the NCP uh, more of a uh, 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 more more tools in their arsenal to be able to meet the uh, requirement that perhaps international investors and local investors uh, may have. Um, and to support the SCCA, a high order was issued that basically instructed government-owned uh, enterprises and entities to utilize the uh, SCCA when dealing with foreign. Uh, enterprises, unless, of course, their own specific uh, bylaws or, or rules um, uh, called uh, otherwise. So that's essentially a, a quick summary of the various um, uh, developments that have happened. As you can see, the overall theme uh, across uh, all of them is that there is certainly uh, uh, a move, more of a move to uh, support arbitration and allow government entities to engage uh, in arbitration. So with that, um, I'll go back uh, to you. My okay, so I had thank um, you, my thanks. Uh, thank okay. you, and uh, thank you on, on behalf of all the attendees. I'd like to now turn it over to uh, Stuart Patterson, uh, who's the managing partner, Middle East, mm -hmm. and head of the Middle East uh, dispute resolution practice of Herbert Smith Freehills. Uh, welcome, Stuart. I was going to ask you, just really following on from what Zahad was saying about the the role, what role Sharia plays in arbitration in uh, in the kingdom? 
Let's do it. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and thank you um, to James and everyone for, for hosting me um, in, on this uh, event today. I'm conscious of time, so I'll try to keep my comments um, relatively brief if I can do. Um, I, I think the, the issue of um, Sharia um, arose to me as a, an important point to, to mention when sort of sitting back and thinking about the topic of this event today, which is how, how well um, arbitration is doing in the kingdom and why. And for me, that is very much around a number of key um, factors or considerations that um, the country has um, to take into account of in, in order to, to support the growth of arbitration. One of those is essentially government commitment to, to delivering it. And we've seen that through some excellent legislation in terms of the arbitration law, the enforcement law, the law creating the SCCA, and of course, then the regulations that it, that it provides. So a, a number of um, very positive legislative developments have really transformed the arbitration landscape over the last, um, the last decade. Um, and of course, um, together with that training and awareness among the judiciary um, to support that, that, um, that, that transformation of the legislation. And another key consideration um, is, um, is certainty investors um, looking to develop projects or make investments into the kingdom um, are looking for certainty in relation to how their investments will be looked after once they've made them and it's those investments that of course in due turn um, generate disputes and arbitration so without the investment there won't be the arbitration um, and that certainty consideration is the one that gives rise um, to a question mark about the, the role of sharia and the third but i'll just mention it very briefly is the competitive position. Of course, there are a number of other um, GCC states that have launched um, with quite a good degree of success um, arbitration centers um, that are looking to win arbitration business, not just relating to their own jurisdiction, but more broadly around the region. So DIFC, ADGM, Qatar, and of course the BCDR, which we're very close to James's heart, um, have won a great deal of arbitration around the region. Um, and um, for, for work that covers Saudi Arabia over the last um, so many years. And I think Saudi is slightly behind in terms of winning that um, work. And, um, and of course, it's making great strides now in, in catching up, but is, it is slightly behind competitively, I would say, in terms of um, the timing of the developments that it's made. Um, so going back to the point about certainty and Sharia, the, um, the laws that have come into place in the last few years um, are all um, very much um, modern laws. So the um, arbitration law is, is closely, um, is very similar to the inter model law. There are a few, a few small differences. Um, but there are, of course, um, a number of references to it being subject to the provisions of Sharia. And as um, a foreign investor not familiar with um, the role of Sharia in the Saudi legal system, that just creates an element of uncertainty and doubt as to how a matter might ultimately be dealt with um, when it reaches um, a tribunal and then subsequently in relation to enforcement. And I think that's just a, a matter that needs to be kept in mind. I'm not saying it needs to change, but it's a matter that affects um, confidence to an extent among foreign investors. Um, I would say, though, that, that there have been a number of developments in that area that have been very positive. Um, so, for example, in relation to one obvious area, um, there's a lot more practitioner awareness of the areas of Sharia that are likely to be of concern, both in terms of substantive law issues, but also procedural issues. So, of course, on the substantive law areas, practitioners generally know that interest isn't going to be um, enforceable if it's if it's um, contained in a in an award and you bring that for enforcement in Saudi Arabia or something that relates to other areas that um, are contrary to the principles of Sharia such as gambling contracts but there are of course areas around the edges so for example derivatives contracts um, or life insurance areas like that where there is there is still uncertainty and I think there is room for improvement in terms of those sorts of areas, more clarity around what is and isn't acceptable. But going back to my point about the positive trend, um, and I know Henry will talk about a lot of cases in a moment, but we've recently been involved in a matter um, which involved um, a Saudi party um, and a very eminent Saudi arbitrator as a member of a panel of three and another um, very prominent um, regional arbitrator. Um, in which an award was given um, against the Saudi party, which recognized um, um, our client's claim for um, late payment um, charges. 
And it seems to me that you could essentially have swapped the words late payment for interest. It was essentially the same thing. Um, but the tribunal found um, that the payment in question was essentially compensatory in nature and therefore upheld it um, at, a, at, a, at a number, at a level that was um, a, a, good, um, a good figure from my client's perspective. It wasn't a, um, a, a derisory or nominal sum. Um, it, however, distinguished the right to that compensatory um, sum, which was paid in relation to the historic period um, up until the date of the award versus making an award in relation to any um, period until final payment, any future period, because that future period involved uncertainty and therefore would be contrary to um, Sharia. So that seems to me to be a very good example of a more sort of positive um, purposive approach to um, to international um, business contracts and how they can be applied in a way that um, that makes sense of those contracts in in the way that they were intended um, and um, I think that's a very very positive development. Um, I think also another development that's that's positive. What well, I say development, a feature of the arbitration law, is that there is an ability to separate out when looking at enforcement any elements of um, an award that are contrary to um, Sharia or public policy, but leave the rest intact, um, rather than for the entirety of, um, of an award, for example, to be um, to be annulled where there is a part of it that is um, inappropriate for enforcement. So those are my sort of headline points on them um, on Sharia and why it's relevant. And I think it's just a question of how we can improve in certainty um, and predictability to achieve better um, investor confidence, but it's certainly happening um, already in my view. And I think the other point um, made about the, the big projects that are being um, launched and undertaken in Saudi is another good example of that, because increasingly those projects are um, seeing Saudi arbitration clauses being used, which is a clear sign that foreign parties are very happy um, to, um, to arbitrate in Saudi Arabia. Stuart, thank you. Would you mind uh, if I pass, moved on to... Um... Uh, Henry, because you you started to take us to the theme of enforcement, and one of the things that has come up on Q and A is how you enforce arbitral awards in in the kingdom. So, um, if I may pass over to Henry and thank Stuart on behalf of everybody. Uh, Henry leads the practice of um, DLA Piper in the Middle East, and uh, he also sits as an arbitrator. So. Henry, I think uh, I was going to ask you about enforcement generally because that's come up on the Q and A. But I think there's there's some recent cases that you were going to going to mention. So, Henry, over to you. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, look, I'll jump straight in, but just to, to take um, the initial point, which is how do you enforce? And it's important that people know that this is all now online and ex parte in the first instance. So. For people who think that Saudi litigation is in some way backward, it isn't. Um, it's an online application. The initial enforcement application is ex parte, so the enforcement judge will make an initial decision ex parte, so without involving the award debtor at all. And it's only if he decides that it's an enforceable award that you then uh, get the award debtor notified and then they come and try to challenge it. Um, but yeah, just to share four examples of enforcement cases, just so people can see, people can see, I think, from what's just been said, the building blocks are in place um, for a good enforcement and arbitration regime in Saudi. It's important now that we see track record, and that's been the case throughout the Middle East. We need to show the track record to get more confidence. Um, so just quickly talking about four awards. First award is one I've written about and spoken about previously, which is the Intracom Award. That was the first award, as so far as I'm aware, which was enforced, uh, successfully enforced under the New York uh, Enforcement Law, uh, an ICC London Award, $20 million. Um, the key challenge to enforcing that award was demonstrating that London, the English courts, as the courts of the seat of the arbitration, would reciprocally enforce Saudi awards. And that was the stumbling block there, which we got over. So it's important that you deal with reciprocity when you're making your initial application. Uh, it may be that you can deal with it simply by demonstrating that the courts of the seat are in a country which is signatory to the New York Convention. It may be that the Saudi judge needs more than that, but that's the starting point. Uh, the second case 
um, was an ICC Paris Award. Um, it was a construction case, a German company um, got an award against a Saudi party. Um, I guess the key question uh, that came up on that one, again, it was successfully enforced, so another good, good news story. Um, the award debtor came forward and said, I wasn't notified of the arbitration, so you need to set aside your enforcement decision. Um, the enforcement judge reproduced evidence showing that it had been notified and just simply chose not to take part. So the enforcement judge himself dismissed the application. He went on appeal and the appeal court not only dismissed the application, it also said very helpfully and positively, I think, um, that the enforcement court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear challenges to the award. It's a procedural court. And so it, wasn't, it doesn't have jurisdiction to even hear those arguments, which I thought was a very positive development. Um, third, quickly, the third case was a Cairo award. I wasn't involved in the case, but I've seen the decision. Um, and in short, it was a Saudi government entity which took part in the Cairo arbitration, uh, but on enforcement argued that since it was a government body and hadn't uh, obtained the approval uh, that Zayad was talking about, uh, the arbitration agreement was void. And the court in that case decided that since um, the award debt had participated in the arbitration without challenging jurisdiction, it couldn't now go back on that affirmative submission to the jurisdiction of the okay. tribunal. Um, and then the final one, if I've still got time. Carry on, just briefly. Yeah, the final one is currently unsuccessful, um, but for understandable reasons. And this is why it's very important that you educate the tribunal during the arbitration about what needs to go in the award. And in short, the award stated um, that so-and-so, the claimant, is entitled to X amount of money. That's all it said. And the enforcement judge said that was insufficiently clear uh, to, for him to order the respondent to pay the claimant money. Um, and so that, um, that's unfortunately been unsuccessful thus far, but perhaps for understandable reasons. Thank you, Henry. Uh, we just got, we've got about a minute and a half left. I was just going to ask you about um, your view of uh, arbitrating in Saudi. I think I'm going to know what you're going to say in, in using ad, ad hoc or um, using the institutional rules of the SCCA. Right. Well, the first thing I should say is that I agree with Stuart. I'm seeing a lot of SCCA arbitration clauses now, and the the communication with clients has changed significantly uh, in that clients are much more happy to choose the SCCA, uh, whether it be from a positive perspective of what arbitration in Saudi is like, or it kind of let's bite the bullet now rather than have the arbitration elsewhere and then enforce it in Saudi. Whichever way it is, it's increasing. Um, but in short, uh, my own previous, my own current experience is don't choose ad hoc arbitration in Saudi because, like many jurisdictions around the world, it means that there's room for messing about. Normally, through uh, refusing to appoint an arbitrator and challenging an arbitrator when appointed, and that can push out the appointment process for the tribunal um, by many months in my personal experience, unfortunately. Okay. Well, Henry, that, I think we've uh, brought ourselves back onto time. So thank you to all three of you for that. And also for some really exciting and positive um, stuff that's going on to the kingdom. So James, uh, may I hand back to you and to take us on to the next stage. Thank you. I think you're muted, James. Apologies. Thank you, Michael. And um, very good news indeed. I think, uh, as uh, Stuart was mentioning, part of the task is to, is to convert uh, the, a lot of the pre-existing ad hoc cases to institutional, which, by the way, has been going on since pretty much the day the centre opened. So a lot of people have opted for that quite rightly. Um, and also judicial dialogue to ensure that, that what Stuart mentioned and what Henry mentioned and Ziad mentioned um, continues, i.e. That, that the judiciary is engaged. And I can tell you that uh, Dr. Hamid Mirah, the CEO of the Centre, 
and, and uh, has led, and we've all engaged with dialogue with the judiciary for the for the last decade, and it's it's paying off. And the judges themselves have been very consistent and clear that they're there to support the party, uh, the party's autonomy and intent and interest. So they're not there to to be obstacles, but to facilitate things. And one of the articles from the GAR speaks to the judicial record uh, of enforcing foreign awards and foreign judgments, which again, we can share with you. But I'm delighted now to move on to our final session before the networking event. And that is to uh, a dear friend and colleague, uh, arbitrator, mediator, and barrister, Michael Patrick Joyce QC, who has uh, the honor of summarizing and perhaps adding some of his own insights on practice in the kingdom. Michael. James, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I must say that as I sat here, I felt increasingly like the shadow chancellor of the Exchequer uh, being expected to respond to the budget, where much detailed and careful, present, uh, careful preparation goes into the presentation, whether of the budget or in this case, the webinar, and yet an instantaneous response uh, is then required. Uh, so I shall do my best. And in these closing remarks, I really want to do three things. The first is to say a word on behalf of the audience. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to express our thanks. And of course, up till now, I've been uh, a part of the and a member of the audience too, to the panelists and to the moderators of both panels for presentations of excellent quality and content. I've enjoyed listening to what you've said and also the clarity with which you've said it. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, as I'm sure everyone in the audience has. So my first task is simply to say thank you. The second thing that I want to look at, I'll look at in a little bit more detail, uh, and that is to try to put what's been said uh, in uh, a contemporary context, and to do that largely by drawing out uh, the strands of what has already been said. And it's not only the direction of travel of ADR in the kingdom that is impressive, uh, that, to uh, continue the analogy, has been well signposted. Uh, it is, in addition to the direction, the speed with which the ground is being covered, uh, that I would say is uniquely impressive. And amongst uh, many of the speakers, Stuart, of course, touched on this, saying that from a relatively uh, slow start compared with other jurisdictions uh, in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia, to mix my metaphors at this juncture, is very much coming up on the rails. Uh, and of course, in this context, most ADR centres take literally years to find their feet, whereas the SCCA has found a firm footing immediately. Uh, I don't want to be held to precise numbers. Uh, Chris Alberti can provide those. But I do know that filed requests for arbitration are comfortably, very comfortably, into three figures, with already tens of completed arbitrations. The mediation programme has met with continuing success too, uh, as both Rosanna and Mossad highlighted uh, in their presentations. And it's perhaps interesting to reflect on the ingredients of this success. Now, of course, depending on your perspective, it's quite easy to identify one or two elements and overlook others. Uh, of course, I must begin by the care and attention which was devoted to the establishment of the SCCA itself. That was pivotal. But think also of the policy drivers too, uh, the new, uh, not actually that new now, arbitration law and enforcement law back in 2012 and 2013, setting the scene. Uh, and as Ziad indicated uh, in his comments, updated very recently, so far as the arbitration law itself is concerned. And also with the continued impetus seen 
very recently in the procurement law, uh, the GTPL, the Government Tender and Procurement Law of 2020, and the privatization law governing public-private partnerships of earlier this year. Again, pieces of legislation uh, that Zayed Kashem touched on in his presentation. Uh, beyond that, of course, law is fine, but it needs to be in the broader context, supported by the courts of the jurisdiction, supported during the arbitral process and after at the point of enforcement, uh, as Henry was just uh, speaking. Uh, one must add to the mix the specificity of the SCCA rules, uh, paying close attention to considerations uh, of Sharia uh, that Stuart was speaking about, uh, recent rule amendments uh, to Appendix 1 and the fee schedule, which was referred to in the video, uh, and with ongoing work to make sure that the rules are fully responsive to changes in circumstance, uh, whether that's prompted by COVID uh, or otherwise. NADR Centre's success also reflects user choice and preference. Uh, it's not that many years ago that the kingdom was popularly regarded as off limits for arbitration, not least because of the perceived problems some would have regarded it as impossibility to enforce. How times have changed, as Henry emphasised, the ease with which you can move for an ex-party application. The building blocks are, as he said, in place. What is needed is the track record. And of course, there is always a time lapse between putting a system in place and recognition and perception of what has been done. That will follow. Uh, now, um, enforcement in Saudi Arabia is therefore well on the way to being reliable and continuing with my uh, road analogy, a well metalled road in terms of dealing with uh, issues of reciprocity, uh, the emphasis or the uh, clarity which has now been brought uh, to the fact that the enforcement judge uh, is acting procedurally only uh, the uh, effect of submitting to the jurisdiction, precluding a subsequent challenge, uh, and also uh, the uh, sensible uh, reminder uh, that one should always educate one's tribunal uh, so that uh, proper form is followed. Another important aspect is understanding, understanding what different types of dispute resolution can do and can achieve. And here, while I'm not overlooking the merits of arbitration, I have mediation particularly in mind. Can mediation create a win-win outcome where litigation is, or arbitration, uh, is essentially zero sum, one winner, one loser? How is that legal alchemy uh, to be achieved? And how is it also to be conveyed to actual and potential users? Here, of course, the outreach spearheaded by uh, the Centre in relation to information and education programmes has played a very important role uh, as the title of the webinar makes plain, making ADR work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It seems to me that all these ingredients have come together, enabling us to take stock of arbitration in the Kingdom, debunk some of the myths and identify and analyze some of the trends. In terms of mediation, the panel has looked at what works, how mediation is becoming established, how it can be used to advantage. Uh, but there are, of course, also new avenues to be explored. Uh, one uh, might be investor state disputes, where in the last four to five years, there's been a detectable increase in certainly investor state arbitrations, 
where Saudi Arabia has either been the home state of the claimant or in some instances, the respondent state. How many of those arbitrations might be susceptible effectively of mediation? That brings me on to the third and final thing that I want to do in these remarks. And it's really an extension of the point that I've just referred to. That new vistas in dispute resolution are opening up. Uh, indeed, to speak of avenues is perhaps too limited. Uh, new vistas, whether in the field of investor state or in artificial intelligence and digital disputes or blockchain or fintech, or perhaps most topical of all in the field of environmental law. Saudi Arabia, as you know, launched the Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative, uh, both aspects, uh, both initiatives, keying into the Vision 2030, which uh, Zayed was referring to, albeit in a different context. Saudi Arabia started these initiatives, launched these initiatives in April of this year. The inaugural forum of both uh, initiatives is now inked in the diary for late October 2021. Now, recently I was looking at the UN Environmental Programme and the first global report that it published into environmental rule of law, quite recently published in January 2019. In the course of the report, it spoke about, quote, promoting collaborative governance through inclusive procedures and mediation across a range of stakeholders. Uh, and the report, it's quite a long report, over 250 pages, went on at several points to emphasize the merits of ADR in the context of environmental law, but also environmental rule of law. Now, now is not the time to go into that in any greater detail. Uh, but I raise it as a further modest contribution to how ADR might continue to be innovatively applied both in the kingdom as part of the Saudi Green Initiative and within the wider region as part of the Middle East Green Initiative. That concludes what I have to say formally by way of my closing remarks. It's not, however, quite my last word. I have three short last words. Uh, first, to thank the panelists and moderators again. Second, to thank RDB and the SCCA for hosting this webinar. Uh, and third, to repeat what James has already said, uh, namely that there is immediately after this a networking session, uh, which I hope you will uh, join. So I will now hand you back to the organisers. Do stay for the networking session. But for now, thank you all. Thank you, Michael. And um, you'll all see what Michael said in the chat. The link has been posted there. It's also been emailed to all of you. And I want to echo what Michael said and invite you all there. Thanks again, Michael, for your excellent summation and analysis as always. And also um, on behalf of Michael Cover, uh, RDB Chambers, and Dr. Hamid Mirab, the CEO of the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration, and myself, sincere appreciation to Chris Alberti, Fatayar Taswia, Masad Al Kherb, SCCA, Ziad Hashem, Hashem and Associates, Stuart Patterson. Herbert Smith Freehills and Henry Quinlan DLA Piper. Also, thanks to Martin Poulter of RBB because he's worked uh, to pull this event together as well, along with Mohammed Khalid, who runs the PR department, uh, Chief of Marketing for SCCA, um, Mossad's team with Ms. Nof, and also with Usman uh, Nassim because these people have done a great deal of work. So, I'd like to invite you all to participate in the session. Please make sure you do click the link. Uh, inside this box or copy it or the one that was sent to you.